Thanks very much, Tomas. Hi, I'm Peter Huang, and I'm the CEO of Marco Therapeutics. We're a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ, and so we always have to start out with our forward-looking uh, statements, disclaimers. I will be making forward-looking statements, and I encourage you to look at our public filings for a comprehensive description of all of our risk factors. Um, so we have a very different and I think novel approach to cell therapies um, versus the typical uh, carb modified or TCR modified T cells or even uh, a TIL program in that we have a program where we are generating a T cell population that is not genetically modified um, but is uh, selected to be tumor specific to multiple uh, tumor associated antigens. In fact, um, there are many differences with um, this approach. Um, the, the first being that uh, we, we tend to use a much, much lower dose of cells. So our dosing range currently ranges from 5 million cells per meter squared to about 20 million cells per meter squared. That is roughly translated into a large adult, no more than 40 million cells a patient, which as you all know, is a comparably uh, very, very low dose of cells. In addition, um, we currently do not lymphodeplete the patient, and so we do not use cyclophosphamide or fludarabine um, prior to using our therapy. Uh, and like I said, uh, we do not gene modify the cells, and so this all allows us to produce uh, a product at considerably lower cost than a typical virus or transposon modified uh, cell therapy program. Um, so, versus a, a traditional CAR-T or, uh, or TCR therapy, um, I apologize here, I seem to be having some trouble moving the page. Oh, here we go. Is there, is there animation or? There is an animation. Um, uh, a typical uh, gene-modified cell program um, as you know, targets a single antigen, uh, although we know that uh, many tumors are heterogeneous in nature. And so uh, when this program was initiated at Baylor in 2012, um, the, the goal of the program was to try to find a way to address a very heterogeneous tumor um, by creating a product that was equally heterogeneous. And so um, when, when we talk about the program itself, it looks like uh, it's working on a lag with me here, so bear with me through the animations. The, um, oh, look at that. <laughs> it looks like I have uh, I have far overclicked. Okay. So. Return everything. <laughs> Sorry. Or is it overclicked, and then you click back, so it's now going forwards and backwards. Have animation. You were on the slide number six, seven? Uh, seven. Uh, this, this one. You can put it on here. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So ignoring the, the technical difficulties here, um, the, the question that, that I think that is, is natural to ask is, look, I mean, if we're not, if we're not lymphodepleting and we're, using, and we're not genetically modifying and enhancing the T cells and that uh, we're using a very low dose of cells, how is it that we expect that we'll be able to get therapeutic results? And so um, if you look at the bottom part of the page here, what I would tell you is that what we're finding in our clinical results is that I think that that our T cells, this cell therapy is acting very differently than um, a typical uh, cell therapy in that uh, cell therapies today are generally primarily focused towards direct tumor lysis. That is, is that um, the, the therapeutic effect is, is driven entirely by the direct killing of the infused T cells. And what we're finding in our program is that our cell therapy is acting in a way that's very, very different. In fact, it's more like a hybrid of a traditional cell therapy and um, a, something of a checkpoint in that uh, our infused cells do initiate a process of direct tumor lysis, exposing antigens, uh, and, and uh, helping to convert a previously immunosuppressive environment into one that's capable of recruiting the endogenous immune system. And secondly, and we think that this effect may have even greater effect than the direct tumor lysis caused by our, our T cells, our infused T cells, 
uh, acting like a checkpoint in terms of re-engaging the endogenous immune system. So when we introduce a multi-antigen specific product, in this case specific for up to five tumor associated antigens, we can do broad-based killing up front that exposes target antigens and helps to, to uh, recruit the native endogenous immunity to attack those, uh, those tumor cells that express even antigens that are not included within our product itself. And so how do we do this? So today the manufacturing process is identical for all of our products, although um, there is a difference in the source of blood. So to the extent that a patient is getting an allogeneic stem cell transplant, we'll, we always want the T cells to match the stem cell repertoire of, of that patient. And so if a patient is getting an allotransplant, we take blood from the donor. If a patient is not getting an allotransplant, then we drop blood from the patient. To date, because we, uh, we've required so little blood, in fact, we can manufacture with as little as 80 mils of blood. We have typically manufactured by, uh, from blood drawn by needle draw rather than by apheresis. And the manufacturing process itself is extremely simple. So we separate the blood into monocytes and PBMCs. Up front, there's a seven-day maturation process in order to mature those, dendritic, uh, the, those monocytes into dendritic cells. Once the dendritic cells are matured, then we simply put them in a cell culture device um, with an aliquot of the PBMCs. Uh, a cytokine mix that, is in, that has been designed to prevent antigenic competition. That is, that typically what people found was that the, it was possible to grow T cell monocultures based on a single peptide, but to the extent that you tried to grow a polyclonal T cell population in a monoculture blood, they were undetectable, either by tetramer staining or by deep seek being therapeutically relevant, and yet we see that a third of the anti-tumor effect as measured by expansion of the T cells in the patient comprise these particular clones. Um, what, what I'll do is I'll actually skip to some of the clinical data to show that, um, that this therapy can be particularly relevant. So these are 15 patients who had active disease in lymphoma who were treated with our therapy. Um, the blue lines here represent patients who got stable disease. The green lines represent patients who developed the CR. Uh, the red uh, caps represent uh, the time that those patients actually progressed. And the first thing that I'll note is that the worst we did for patients uh, was that we saw transient stabilization of disease. Um, and so when you look at the stable disease patients, you see that um, these patients have uh, sometimes uh, relapsed between three to nine months out, although there, there's a notable example of a patient who seems to be indefinitely stabilized uh, post receipt of the T cells. Um, the interesting thing about this for me is that when you look at the overall time to progression, it actually closely resembles the progression-free survival curve of all patients who received a CD19 CAR. Now, this patient population is more diverse than what you, we see in a typical CAR study, and that includes both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's patients, but we have not been able to discern any meaningful difference between the patients who we treated with Hodgkin's lymphoma versus, uh, say, DLBCL. Of the DLBCL population, uh, there were seven patients with DLBCL, four of them generated CRs, although one of them was a little bit mystifying, that's patient number 15. That, that patient was confounding because they received our T cells in December of 2017, um, saw a little bit of a decrease in SUV from double digits to eight, but we saw no resolution of the, uh, the tumor by PET scan, so we scored that patient stable disease. The patient actually ended up progressing on to an experimental CD19 therapy in April of 2018, saw no response to that therapy, including no evidence of CAR-T expansion. Interestingly enough, when we actually did a deep biopsy of the patient in November of 2018 in preparation for ASH, that patient was found to be disease-free. So we know that that patient converted to CR sometime um, between December of 2017 uh, and 2018, whether that was a complete response to our T cells or the experimental CAR, it's impossible for us to say. But what I can say about these patients is that they are heavily pretreated patients. So um, rather than being closely controlled for two to four lines of prior therapy, these patients on average failed four to seven lines of prior therapies. Several of them failed 
as many as nine lines of prior therapy uh, before coming onto our cells. I think it's possible to overstate the, um, the, uh, the comparison with CAR T, though, because I think that what's important to take away from this is that I think that this is an, a very, very different cell therapy in its own right. And that in the long term, I have a vision for this therapy where it may be used broadly as a maintenance therapy for patients who are in remission from any prior therapy. So because the, these cells appear to do very little harm to patients, because we can produce these cells relatively inexpensively and price the therapy at a level that's appropriate for a maintenance therapy, and because these cells are natural T cells, in the absence of tumor, we don't worry about them disappearing because we think that they retreat into memory phenotype. There is a school of thought that says that no different than providing a woman hormones after surgical resection after breast cancer, that any patient in remission from any prior therapy, including first line standard of care, should just get cells as a matter of course, if we think that these cells are protective. And we do. So these are patients who have received cells after generating a remission from a prior therapy. What I will tell you is that these patients were so refractory that their best prior remission for the first 11 patients ranged only from one month to five months with a median of four. You can see here with the length of time in ongoing complete remission, over three years, over three, over four, over two, over four, over three, over two, over three, over two, over two, and over one year, that we can definitively say that we have generated the best ongoing remission for these patients while receiving these cells as a maintenance therapy. And these patients now, the first 12, have a median uh, duration of CR that, it, that approaches 40 months. You should be seeing these patients at this point approaching their median progression-free survival. And we, you can see that we are nowhere near the median progressor. In fact, um, patient number two and number three are the same patient here. And so we've only seen two progressors. We have not seen a single progressor in the last 13 months. Patient number two, by the way, is a patient who uh, received cells after generating uh, a CR to RCHOP, saw eight months in CR post RCHOP, relapsed, then got another CR from arbendostamine, received our cells again as a maintenance therapy, and is now over three years ongoing in complete remission with the use of the T cells alone as a maintenance therapy. Um, so once again, why is this happening? Why, why with a small dose of T cells, no lymphodepletion and no gene modification, are we seeing these results? And we believe that the answer is that, um, that we're getting significant assistance from the re-engagement of the endogenous immune system. So you can see here, this particular patient prior to infusion of our T cells, had very few T cells that were specific for the antigens that we infused. After we uh, infused our T cells, you see an expansion of T cells that closely matches the antigen expression level on the tumor, being a high SSX2 and a high NYSO1 expressor. But the reason that we think that this, this CR has been so durable over three years now in ongoing CR is that we see uh, consistently in our patients a second wave of T-cell expansion of T-cells that we did not infuse in the patient. In this case, we can identify a group of cells that have expanded that are specific for MAJ3 and cells that are specific for MAJ1. WT1 here is the negative control. WT1 is not on lymphoma. And so it is our way of showing that we are not expanding T-cells that are not specific for the tumor. This is a, a patient with a mixed Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's uh, DLBCL. Um, and uh, what's significant about this is that when we started dosing patients in 2012, we not only started at a really low dose, 5 million cells per meter squared, so no more than 10 million cells for an adult patient, um, but the, the FDA was significantly concerned about toxicity, and so they forced us to antigen escalate before dose escalating. So we had to dose two patients with a single antigen product, wait six weeks, dose two patients with a two antigen product. It took us almost a year and eight patients to antigen escalate to the full product. Thankfully, this particular patient was a high expressor in both PREM and SSX2, the two antigens that they received T cells for. But when you see expansion of the MAGE A4 and NYSO1 T cells in this case, that's epitope spreading because that was not included in the product. 
One thing that's important to understand is the, the kinetics of this are very different from what you may be used to seeing in a gene-modified product, in that because we have such a low dose of cells and that we're not lymphodepleting, we don't see the same sort of peak expansion of T cells that is typical in a TCR or CAR-modified uh, cell program. In fact, what we tend to see is a slow expansion of the T cells. They end up comprising between 2 to 4 percent of the circulating lymphocytes in uh, the patient's circulating peripheral blood. Um, the patients um, typically report feeling better almost immediately after an infusion. We generally wrote that off to effects, but it has been consistently reported now amongst um, almost 100 patients. They do become asymptomatic within a few weeks, and they see disease stability very quickly within that few week period. But when they convert to CR, it generally happens a month to three months after infusion of the cells. In this case, it happens sometime between month three and month nine. And here, um, what I think is notable is that I, if you look at the expansion of the T cells at month three, you can see that the expansion is highly PREM and NYESO1 mediated. And I think that, um, that I would contend that there would have been a significant chance of losing this patient had we only had a product that was specific for PREM or NYESO1, in that uh, you can see that by month nine, the expansion profile is very much changed. In fact, the ESO1 and, and PREM T cell populations are actually in decline. So what we think is happening is exactly what the evolutionary biology would lead us to expect, which is as we kill down the PREM and NYESO1 expressing tumor, the antigen expression is changing on this tumor. That, that tumor which does not express PREM and NYESO1, in this case primarily uh, expressing MAJ4, is beginning to grow out. And Thankfully, our product was able to adapt alongside that. Um, we also have significant uh, 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 patient experience in AML, ALL, and multiple myeloma. These are patients with uh, relapsed refractory disease post-transplant who otherwise have uh, really a, a historical overall survival expectation of about four and a half months. These are patients that we treat uh, as a maintenance therapy after transplant. I'm going to point out a couple of interesting things. One is that we seem to be deriving significant therapeutic benefit. You see significant debulking of disease, restoration of normal hemopoiesis. But here is probably the most striking example of um, the interplay between cells and tumor. This patient is a 57-year-old female who we treated um, in the adjuvant arm of the disease. So for the first 60 days, we don't treat um, to get her out of the GVHD period. Uh, at day 60, we treated her with our cells, and she got the only grade 3 adverse event that we've ever observed. It was a grade 3 elevation of liver enzymes. The doctors gave her steroids to treat that condition and suppressed our T cells. When they did so, the patient got significant.